Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. Today is a special day, because we're looking at Dr. Sleep, the sequel to The Shining, released in 2019. This movie means so much to me, I don't know where to begin. I've been a Stephen King fan my entire life, thanks to my dad, and read the 2013 novel Dr. Sleep when I found out a movie adaptation was being made. I enjoyed the book, but I had a few issues with it. Mostly, I feel like things were just too easy for the protagonists. That's not the case at all with the movie, which I actually enjoyed more than the book. But that's no big surprise, considering it was written and directed by Mike Flanagan. Flanagan's been working in the horror genre since his feature debut in 2011, Absentia. Since then, his work has included the well-regarded Ouija sequel, the Karen Gillan starring Oculus, and the phenomenal Hush, which he made with his wife Kate Siegel, and which I previously covered on The Kill Count. He's also responsible for the Hauntings of Hill House and Bly Manor series on Netflix, as well as the fantastic Gerald's Game, based on another Stephen King novel that was once considered unfilmable. But he made it filmable because Mike Flanagan kicks ass. I am a big stupid fan of everything he does, because he always writes characters you care about and uses the camera in the scariest way possible. I should probably take a minute to disclose that the first time I saw Dr. Sleep was on a paid trip from Warner Brothers that took Chelsea and me to the Stanley Hotel in Colorado, and allowed us to interview Flanagan and his longtime producer Trevor Macy. The experience is still the coolest thing I've ever gotten to do because of dead meat, so sure, you can say it helped prime me to like this movie. But I also love Dr. Sleep because it's a really good movie. This is a director at the time top of his game, giving us a vast tapestry of unique visuals to look at while we explore the magical world of The Shining. There aren't a lot of horror movies that truly feel epic, but I can safely say Dr. Sleep is among them. It sets up a bunch of characters all across the country, lets you get to know them, then intersects their stories in combative and tragic ways, all of their lives linked by the ambiguous psychic power known as The Shining. Though it follows a grown-up Danny Torrance, played by Ewan McGregor, what's great about Dr. Sleep is that it's a unique and original story. This movie would be amazing even if it wasn't a Shining sequel, and for the first two hours of its runtime, it mostly isn't. The final half hour is a huge reminder of its source material, and is probably the weakest part of the film. But it's still an impressive feat considering that Flanagan had to serve two masters. As a fan, I felt for a very long time there were two visions of The Shining that seemed to be in competition within the minds and hearts of a lot of fans. The Stephen King Shining and there was the Kubrick Shining. The man pulls it off because he's a goddamn virtuoso. I consider us all lucky to live in a world where Mike Flanagan makes horror movies. One last note, I'll be using the theatrical version for the kill count, but I've also watched the director's cut, which adds almost an entire half hour of extra footage. And guess what? That version's even better. So expect a cut comparison in the next few months. Two and a half hours is still plenty Plenty of time to kill people though. Let's see how many. The movie begins by telling you it's a sequel to The Shining. It's already won me over, I'll be honest. In 1980, a young girl named Violet, played by Violet McGraw, young Nell in The Haunting of Hill House, encounters a flower-picking singing lady who might make a good friend. Well, hi there. Yeah, that's friendly. This is Rose the Hat, played by Rebecca Ferguson, in a fucking phenomenal performance. And what's with the hat? Don't worry about it, it's her hat. Rose is doing a trick for Violet when she hears a noise from the woods. Don't worry, that's my friend. You're missing the trick. Yeah, Rose the Hat's got a lot of friends. And they're here because Violet is special, as in the house special. It's the special ones that taste best. Rose grabs Violet's arm and her posse swarms the young girl, killing her off screen. If you're glad it was off screen because it was a little kid, I've got some bad news for you. But first, some good news. Tunnel card! We're back at the Overlook, and though things may look familiar, every frame of footage in this film is a new shot. Except for three, which I'll point out later, but just think about that. Flanagan had to recreate the entire Overlook interior, which, if you remember from The Shining Kill Count, was a big friggin' deal. What Danny Torrance saw in room 237, namely Mrs. Massey, the naked ghost lady, continues to haunt him even after escaping the hotel. She and other Overlook ghouls have been harassing him at home, even hanging out in his bathroom when he's trying to take a tinkle. Guess you'll just have to hold it, little man. Oh, he couldn't hold it. Thank God Wendy's there to give him a soggy pee hug. Danny had 
hasn't spoken since the Overlook incident, but that changes when the ghost of Dick Halloran shows up. The least he can do for that guy is have a conversation. I mean, he was the one who taught Danny what the shine is, after all. And someday, Danny Torrance, you'll teach someone else. Since this story focuses more on the shine than even the shining did, Dick's got a lot of shine splaining to do. He says the shine is an energy that can be used as food by dark things, like the Overlook. And since Danny shines brighter than anyone he's ever seen, the Overlook ate it all up. Nom, nom, nom. And if you're still confused as to what exactly the Shining is, it's, uh magic? This crucial scene continues as Dick tells Doc how to beat the spirits haunting him. All he has to do is make a lockbox in his mind, and he can use that to trap all the ghosts inside. This conversation is taken from the Doctor Sleep book, where it plays out a little differently. After all, in my book, Dick Halloran Lives, Kubrick's movie, Halloran Dies. Given how important all this Shine's position is, I remember wondering how it'd be accomplished in a sequel to Kubrick's film. I even pondered as much in my Shining Kill Count. Dick Halloran survives in the book. He's also alive at the beginning of the Doctor Sleep book, so I'm curious to see what they do with that in the Doctor Sleep movie. In the end, it was a simple fix. And what Mike did was to bring him back as a ghost, which makes perfect sense in the context of the story. And more evidence that Mike Flanagan Flanagan was the perfect person for this job. I also loved his approach to recasting these iconic characters. Carl Lumbly sounds just like Scatman Crothers, and Alex Esso does an excellent Shelley Duvall-esque Danny yell. Danny! But Flanagan didn't just want imitations. He wanted a continuity of character, not necessarily of actor. So it's fine that Roger Dale Floyd doesn't look exactly like Danny Lloyd. You can still tell it's Danny Torrance, just like you can tell Alex Esso is Wendy. It is very big shoes to fill. I, I think that Shelley Duvall's performance in that is the closest thing to a perfect performance in something. Well, you did great, Alex. That night, while watching TV, Danny goes to the bathroom so shit can go down. And I don't mean the drain. Dan the man marches right up to the rotting naked woman and shows Mrs. Massey his mind box, which she does not find pleasant at all. <laughs> Damn, Doc's a big kid now. And 31 years later, in 2011, Doc's a man! A man who gets into bar fights and wakes up next to naked chicks. Whoa, that naked chick, Deanie, is played by Chelsea Talmadge, who was Steve's shitty friend Carol in Stranger Things. Their night of debauchery has left Dan pukey and poor, so he decides to steal cash from the sleeping woman. An immoral act that just got a whole lot immoraler. The ghost of Dick appears and chides him for stealing from the mouth of a hungry babe, but it doesn't stop Dan from leaving with the cash. In a Long Island movie theater, a man meets with a young woman played by Emily Allen Lind, who we've seen as Melanie in the Babysitter movies. The 17-year-old actor is playing a 15-year-old named Andy, who uses her uniquely persuasive powers to put perverts like this guy to sleep. Sleep? Andy steals the guy's money and permanently shames her predator by carving a snakebite into his face. But snakebite Andy's powers could be used for so much more, which is why Rose's Lieutenant Crow Daddy has tracked her down for Rose to admire in a shot referencing another Stephen King adaptation, The Green Mile. Though snakebite Andy's powers are strong, they're not strong enough to let her escape Rose's attention. You wanna let me go? No, oh, no, sweetie. No, I don't. Now we're in the Granite State. I told you, this movie's sprawling, where Abra Stone is celebrating her fifth birthday with her parents Dave and Lucy. The birthday girl can't help upstaging the magician, shocking her parents when they find out that she's made all the spoons hang from the ceiling. But it's hard to eat a good meal hanging upside down, so Abra drops the utensils, and the resulting crash stirs a drunken Danny awake and gives Rose the hat a shiver that puts a smile on her face. Not that she wasn't happy already. I mean, she did just pick up a pusher. You can push people. Rose wants Andy to push for them, and in exchange, she'll provide a whole lifestyle. One that will allow Andy to age so slowly, she'll still be a teenager in a few hundred years. Eat well. Stay young. Live long. Laugh. 
death love. Wait a minute. Andy's brought to the beach for a ceremony where she meets Rose's crew, including Grandpa Flick, played by Carol Striken, who was Lurch in the Addams Family movies and fucking terrifying in Gerald's game. Andy lies back into Rose's crotch, which reminds me that they made love in the book, and with a sermon from Flick, the group agrees to tie Andy's life into theirs, the true knot. To induct Andy into the true knot, Rose breaks out a thermos full of violet shine, which they call steam. Ready to get steamrolled, Andy? All right, shotgun, little buddy. Andy breathes deep and undergoes a terribly painful process called turning that knocks her out. When she wakes up, it's to daylight, illuminating the True Knot's caravan and their whole boho chic vibe they got going on. You know the True Knot rolls them RVs into Burning Man every year. Rose welcomes Andy to her new life with the Knot, and when Andy asks if she's still human, Rose says it doesn't matter. Do you care? After hitting rock bottom, Dan takes a bus north to a town in New Hampshire called Fraser that, in a hilarious camera reveal, has a smaller version of itself in the town square. It's called Teeny Town, built by neighborhood kids and overlooked, no pun intended, by Billy Freeman, a wonderful man played by Cliff Curtis, who's in a ton of shit, including Deep Rising, Fear the Walking Dead, and The Meg. Billy sees that Danny's a stranger and recognizes him as a man in need, so he hooks him up with a sweet loft to stay in, one that's all already furnished and has a chalkboard wall. Nice. Why are you doing this? You don't know me. No, I don't. But I know the look. I'm glad that Dan Dan's found a new friend, cause it's hard to have good conversations with people like Dead Deanie, who only ever wants to talk about how dead she is. They haven't found us yet. I'll take Deanie's word that her and her poor baby have died of overdose and starvation, their bodies still rotting where Danny left them. And if you don't want to see a dead baby, don't look, cause that is one creepy baby corpse. Aww. Aw no! The encounter nearly drives Dan to drink, but he instead hits up Billy, who immediately takes him in, cause Billy's the fucking best. He takes Danny to an AA meeting run by Dr. John Dalton, a character who's much bigger in the book. Good call for the adaptation, but it's it's too bad we don't get more Bruce Greenwood, who was Gerald, he of the game, as well as the only man good enough for Joan Holloway. Dr. John gives Dan his day one token, as well as a job opportunity in a scene shot just like Jack's interview at the Overlook. Since Dan says dying people don't really bother him, John gets him a job at a hospice as an orderly. He works there with an adorable kitty named Azriel, and taking after its namesake Angel of Death, as he always knows when a patient's about to go. Not a bad last sight to to see, I suppose. Dan comforts this guy by saying dying's just like going to sleep, and that earns him the titular moniker. Start to sleep. Doc may not have a PhD, but he does have the shine, which he uses to soothe the dying man as he leaves the land of the living. On his way out, he exhales a bit of steam, because remember, Dick said that everyone's got a little shine to them. Most of them just don't know it. Of course, Dan's got a lot of shine, and now that he's in New Hampshire, his shine is discovered by the nearby Abra, who writes to him on his chalkboard and giggles that she's found someone special like her. With a job and a pen pal, Dan's able to remain sober for the next eight years. Cause we just jumped some time, motherfuckers, and now it's 2019. He's still doing his doctor sleep job, assuring dying patients like Charlie here that there's more to life after death. And while we don't see Charlie die, I'm still counting him because Azzy never lies, okay? She's a good kitty. Over the past eight years, Dan and Abra have kept up occasional communication, keeping both of them in higher spirits than the members of the True Knot, who nowadays are looking a little worse for wear. Stop coughing on my burger, Grandpa. God! The Knot has been going hungry, hungry for steam, since that's what these shine vampires need to sustain themselves. We feed on children, we eat the steam. Crow Daddy's been trying to track them down some food, but is worried there's not as much steam in the world these days. He says it might be getting dulled down by cell phones and Netflix. Crow's played by Zahn McLarnan, an actor of Hunk Papa Lakota descent, who was also Hanzi in Fargo Season 2, and the subject of the single best hour in Westworld. Love seeing him here as an evil love interest. Although the Knot's steam supply is getting pretty low, Rose breaks out a canister to help the ailing Grandpa Flick. And sure, the rest 
rest of you can get in on it too. Go ahead and huff this kid dust. To re-up their supply, Crow's been tracking a shiny Iowan kid named Bradley Trevor, played by Jacob Tremblay, who we saw in The Predator. He's a real talent on the diamond, as explained by an onlooker played by Danny Lloyd, who was the original Danny Torrance. Lloyd had only ever played a single other role after The Shining, and instead of acting, he became a biology professor in Kentucky. Unfortunately for Bradley Trevor, OG Danny ain't the only one in attendance at this game. While walking home, Bradley is approached by the True Knots van, and Snakebite Andy slithers into the boy's brain, convincing him to come with them. They take him out to an old abandoned plant and tie him down to the ground for a memorably horrific scene wherein Jacob Tremblay gives a devastating performance. No, please let me go! <laughs> Please. His cries don't work on Rose, who tells him the more afraid he is, the better his steam will taste. Are you gonna hurt me? Yeah. No! True to her word, she begins torturing the child to provide her family a feast. It is truly difficult and disturbing to watch. And although Jacob Tremblay was just fine filming the scene, it wasn't as easy for the people playing his assailants. The actors playing the True Knot, who had been full of swagger before the camera rolled, was like, yeah, we're gonna go kill this kid. We're, we're the monsters. <laughs> we're literally so shaken that they had to step away from the set. The incident is so powerful that Abra intercepts it, and she screams in concert with the baseball boy, begging his attackers to stop. Rose senses Abra's eavesdropping, and the connection gives the girl Danny Torrance face, but before you can start thinking about future meals, Rose, you've got to finish the one in front of you. They kill Bradley Trevor slowly and painfully, making the most of their meal and saving the last little bits for later. Bradley's torture does a number on Abra, who has a conniption in her bed and blows a psychic blast toward Towards Danny's chalkboard. She has to let him know about the Red Rum! I mean, Meldad! While burying the baseball boy, Rose tells Crow they had a powerful onlooker spying on them all the way from the East Coast. You're saying someone looked in from 1,500 miles away. With power like that, the Knot may have found a whale, someone with so much shine it could feed their family for decades. Abra finds the baseball boy she felt getting murdered listed on a missing children's page online. Using a printout with powers kind of like a lab. She's able to see the whole road trip he was forced to go on, including exactly which plant his murder took place at. Fuck, I love the overhead shots that are in a weird frame rate. They look so cool! This is one of the movie's many strengths, creating visuals just as fantastic as the powers in this world. The wondrous sights continue as Abra looks for the murderers out her window, and when she doesn't find them there, well, she just drops right into their bodies, because now she's somehow an observer inside Rose the Hat. Rose feels the psychic intrusion, and looks into a reflection, allowing her to use the connection as a two-way. That gives her a glimpse of Abra's current view, and even allows her to interact physically, though not for very long. Get out! Well, you were at the grocery store, Rose. Makes sense you found some food. Rose gets back to the knot and tells Crow Daddy that their onlooker has more steam than they could have ever possibly anticipated. Is she food, or do we turn her? Great question, Crow, but Rose doesn't want that kind of power around competing with her. She'd much rather they yum yum eat her up. Abra skips school the next day and takes a bus to Fraser, then instinctively heads to Teeny Town to meet the train conductor, Dan the Man Torrance. With a brain-to-brain -brain hello, Abra lets Dan know who she is, and they take a seat together on a park bench. You can hear me. Let's use our outside voices, all right? She's excited to find another person who has magic, or as Dan tells her, shine. When I was a kid, I didn't understand the shining. I called it Tony. Abra says the baseball boy also had the shine, until it was eaten by the bad people as they tortured and murdered him. She wants to find the boy's body and bring his murderers to justice, a lofty goal for a teenager, but one that's believable thanks to Kylie Curran, who beat out more than 800 other young actresses to get this role. She does a great job as Abra, especially in her scenes with Ewan McGregor. And we're a good team, I think. But Dan doesn't want to get involved and tells Abra to stop shining so the bad folk won't find her. It's some cowardly advice that earns him a visit later that night. A visit from a g g g g g ghost But it's just dick, Doc. Not an overlook, ghoul. So put those boxes away. You wouldn't want to put your dick in a box. Dick's visiting Dan for the first time since he saw him in Deanie's decrepit apartment eight years ago. Has it been a long time? Can't tell. This world is a dream of a dream to me now. 
Man, I love this scene and the way it drives home how otherworldly the afterlife is. Dick tells Doc that he needs to help Abra, just like he helped Dan all those years ago. Then he says that this is the last time Dan will ever see him, and just like that, he is gone. God, that hits hard. We get another spectacular scene, possibly the film's most visually stunning, when Rose the Hat sits atop her trailer and Astro projects herself into the night sky. With the soundtrack reduced to a heartbeat and heavy breathing, she flies high above the ground, trying to feel out exactly where Abra is. Honing in on the location, she slowly glides down from the sky and makes footfall on Abra's street. Fuck, this movie looks so cool! Oh man, and it just keeps going! As Rose hops on up to the side of Abra's house and drops in horizontally through the window. I cannot get over these effects. Inside Abra's room, which is really her brain, maybe? Rose finds a wall of memories, which reminds me of another Stephen King story, the wild-ass dreamcatcher. But Abra's memory warehouse is actually a hand catcher, because this was a trap laid by this little nightmare. He said you'd come back. Abra's disguise here is scary as hell to me, but I guess it's a reference to the Rooster Teeth anime Ruby's character, Emerald. Abra had a ruby poster in her bedroom shown earlier, which I believe was a set deck suggestion from Kylie Curran herself, since she's a big fan. With Rose Trap, Abra invades her mind and starts rummaging through her memories to learn more about her. Rose escapes in a signature Mike Flanagan way, with some serious, nerve-wrecking hand trauma. The effects for this degloving were done by prolific makeup artist Bob Kurtzman and his wife, Marsha King Kurtzman. They both had plenty of practice, since they did a similar effect in Gerald's game. It's old hat to us now how to mangle hands. We're, we're getting really good at it. With this, Rebecca Ferguson joins the esteemed company of Carla Gugino and Flanagan's wife, Kate Siegel. It's an honor to have your hand savaged in a Mike Flanagan film. Rose is able to stumble away from the trap and tumble on out through the roof, all the way back to her trailer, where she quickly learns she's not the only one there with a problem. Grandpa Flick is in bad condition, because unlike what Andy mistakenly thought she signed up for, the True Not Energy vampires are not completely immortal. I said live long, eat well. Since they haven't been eating well, Grandpa Flick's about to die of hunger, bringing an end to a life so long he once feasted on gladiators in Rome. I love learning about the extent of his longevity, revealed by Rose in a riveting eulogy. And they trembled in their villages and beds and skyscrapers. The members of the True Knot aren't as fleshed out on screen as they are in the book, but that doesn't mean their backstories are entirely absent. Mike Flanagan gave us a lot of creative liberties where we could come up with our own ideas for our character, which is such a gift for an actor. It's fun to hear how Apron Andy was turned by Grandpa Flick in 1500s Morocco, or how Crow Daddy was a native tracker in the French and Indian War. The costume department, led by Terry Anderson, brought a visual element to these histories with trinkets meant to show centuries of travel, like with Rose's beaver felt top hat, a 100 years old antique. But all long lives must come to an end and Grandpa Flick dies, just like all shine vampires do, in a process called cycling. The description of cycling was terrifying in the book, and I didn't think it could live up to it on screen, but goddammit, Mike Flanagan did it, because of course he did. With their steam in short supply, the knot feasts on Flick's remnants like a pack of hungry animals. Things are clearly dire now, so Crow prepares to go capture their whale. And although Rose won't be joining them, since her mind library was compromised, he assures her he can handle Abra. But I got some tricks on my own. Abra tells Dan about her encounter with Rose and asks him to go find the baseball boy's body in Iowa. Dan asks Billy for help with the task, and although it's a long drive, Billy's a fucking bro. They start driving west, with Abra checking in on their progress by astral projecting into the back seat. She tells Dan about her visit to Rose's mind, but when she briefly tries it with him, she sees his boxes and the overlook. Dude, your brain house is scary! After a full day of driving, Billy and Dan reach the plant. And even though Dan's getting directions from a teenage girl that Billy can't see, he's still supportive enough to help dig, because that's just the kind of guy Billy is. Dan's proven right when they find a foot. And you know what feet are kinda like? Hands! And you know what hands usually go with? Faces! And you know what- oh, he puking. The unearthing of this evil rocks Billy to his core, and he puts his faith completely in Dan. Abra's father, understandably, doesn't trust Uncle Dan as much. Your Uncle Dan? 
The fuck you think you are? Hmm? She's 13 years old! Yep, that's, uh, that's gonna happen. Using her powers, Abra stops her dad and flashes him images of the baseball boy murder, allowing him to finally see exactly what his daughter is. Uh, time to drink! But none for that, thanks. With Dan rightfully assuming the True Knot has ways around the police, they are millennia-old energy vampires after all, they take things into their own hands. Or more specifically, Abra's hands. Since a guy named Barry briefly wore Bradley Trevor's mitt, Abra uses that to peek into Barry's present, and sees that an RV full of True Knotters are heading towards them on the highway. They're tracking them through Abra's shine, but Dan's got a plan that'll trick him something good. They go to a state park for another memorable sequence, one that starts with beautiful Beautiful lighting. Don't break out the fog machine for them, Rays? With Rose spectating, the Nod eventually reaches the park and gets out of their RV to find Abra sitting zend up on a picnic table. Snakebite Andy approaches, hissing soothing words, which calms Abra down enough to get stuck with a needle full of drugs. Mmm. Huh, that was easy. Unless... Blast! Bested by the bunny once more! Shots ring out from Dan and Billy in the trees, and since the True Knot is also armed, well, there was a firefight! Andy books it back to the RV as the rest of the Knot is gunned down one by one. Rose anguishes from afar as her entire clan is killed, each of them getting shot and falling to the ground and cycling out of this world until they're nothing but steam. Delicious, delicious steam. The minor True Knot character Characters were played by Mike Flanagan regulars, most of them having acted in The Haunting of Hill House. Robert Longstreet, who was Barry, played caretaker Mr. Dudley. Catherine Parker, Silent Sari, played Poppy Hill. And Selena Andrews, Apron Annie, played Luke's counselor Paige. Matt Clark, who played Short Eddie, wasn't an actor at all, but he did work on Hill House as the set medic, his regular job. I, I thought it could be fun too to have someone who isn't an actor, and Met just ate it up. Finally, Diesel Doug was played by Mike Flanagan's brother James, which, yeah, I mean, dude looks just fucking like him. Dan approaches the RV door, where a lack of bullets gives Andy an opening. She's able to briefly put Dan to sleep, and is just about to murder with some misandry. Fucking. Man. When she's shot by Billy coming around the RV. Another shot takes her down, but she's still got enough life to push out two final words. Kill yourself. Oh no, not you, Billy! No! Billy, the best dude ever, is killed by a suggestion of suicide, and Snakebite Andy is able to see and laugh about it before dying herself and turning into steam. Abra realizes that the crow isn't there, because turns out he's in her kitchen, needling her in the neck. True to his word, Crow Dad. He outsmarted Abra, and in the process, killed her dad with a knife stab to the chest. Dan finds him later, and it confirms David's death. By the way, Abra's mom Lucy left to visit her sick mom earlier, so that's why she's not around. Horror fans may recognize actor Jocelyn Donahue from her starring role in Ty West's House of the Devil. Abra awakens buckled up tight in Crow's van, with too many drugs inside her to properly use her powers. McLarnan has his best scene of the film, as he tells Abra her dad's dead and that it's all her fault. We were always gonna have you. So their deaths, all of them, just a waste. Damn, Abra, get wrecked. Dan fights off the temptation to drink in dismay and instead reaches out to Abra. Even if she can't transmit her powers, maybe she can receive him like a radio. He successfully tunes in to WABR, which allows him to project into the back of Crow's car. The ill-defined powers of the shine continue as Dan touches hands and transfers himself into Abra's body. Kylie Curran is great in this entire movie, but she gets extra points for how well she plays a different character inhabiting her body. Who are you? I'm the guy that killed your friends. And that guy's got another trick up his sleeve, one that'll make Crow wish he had worn his seatbelt. Dan crashes the car into a tree and sends Crow Daddy through the windshield, evoking a scream of anguish from Rose hundreds of miles away. Abra, now in control again, walks up to the dying Crow Daddy and coldly tells him that she hopes his death hurts a lot. Well, I think you're in luck, little lady, because he does not look like he's having a good time. Abra receives a projected visit from Rose, but but now fully confident, she doesn't let it slow her down. All right, bitch child. Uh-oh, Rose is breaking out the good stuff. I guess she might as well just suck all that steam herself. Not like there's any True Knot members left alive to share it with. Dan and Abra reconnect and take off for Colorado. If Rose is coming for a fight, he's gonna choose the venue. There's a place 
place that's dangerous for people like us. And that means it's probably dangerous for Rose, which might just give them a chance. This marks a turning point in Doctor Sleep. After an hour and 50 minutes of being mostly its own story, it's now going to very much be a sequel to The Shining. Appropriately, this is when we get the only recycled footage, the gliding shot over Wild Goose Island, and two shots of the Torrance Volkswagen driving along Going to the Sun Road. Flanagan took these shots and changed them from night to day and clear to snowy in post-production. It's a great bridge to the final act, which admittedly can get a little too referency to The Shining. But I think the rest of the film earns this final act. And tell me you don't feel something seeing The Overlook again boarded up these past 40 years. Dan tells Abra to stay lookout in the car while he heads inside the hotel to wake the place up. Once again, I am in complete awe at how Flanagan was able to recreate one of the most studied film locations of all time. You can tell it was a dream come true for him. Just breathtaking. Every time I walk in here, I'm just floored. Um, it's like walking into your own memory. He spent six weeks building sets from the actual blueprints used for the Kubrick film and underwent what he called forensic film school as he tried to recreate iconic shots and angles. All hands were on deck to bring the Overlook back to life down to the most minute and specific detail. Prop master Scott Nifong was able to find the exact model typewriter Jack Torrance used and recreated the all work no play pages even though they barely appear in this movie. Seems like everyone was happy to do the work, especially Mike Flanagan. Like me, he's been a King fan since he was in the fifth great, and he clearly had a ball making this film. Dan gets the boilers running, which was part of his dad's job as winter caretaker, even though we only ever saw Wendy doing it for him. Then he takes a stroll down memory lane, visiting hallways more Grady Girl free these days, and his family's one-time apartment, including the infamous bathroom door. Here's Obi! His last stop is the gold ballroom, where he takes a seat at the bar just like his dad did all those years ago. Slow night, Mr. Torrance. Not for long, I imagine. The bartender once again identifies himself as Lloyd, but that is hashtag not my Lloyd. It's Jack Attack Torrance. And in case you weren't sure, he proves it by complaining about wives and kids. A man tries. He provides. But he's surrounded by mouths. And a family. A wife. A kid. Those mouths eat time. They eat your days on Earth. Classic Jack. Though this scene is an original creation for the movie, Jack Torrance's spirit does appear in the book, so Flanagan always knew he'd have to cast someone for the role. Jack Nicholson was never approached since he effectively retired after his role in the 2010 box office bomb, How Do You Know? That left Flanagan with the options of recasting or doing some kind of weird digital face replacement thing a la Rogue One Grand Moff Tarkin. It was always going to be controversial, no matter what we did. He decided to cast Henry Thomas, who, as a child, was Elliot in E.T., and as an adult, was the Patriarch in Flanagan's Hill House series. Thomas shaved his head to match Nicholson's high hairline, and though it was a tough role to fill, he deserves major props for doing a Jack Torrance that didn't just become a Jack Nicholson parody. Although, the original film's performance was basically a Jack Nicholson self-parody. Flanagan wrote this scene to convince King to give this movie his blessing. It showed the author that the filmmaker understood The Shining's themes, how the hotel was a metaphor for addiction, and how Jack Torrance was a man terrified of hurting his own family if he didn't fix himself. It was a personal story for Stephen King, who wrote The Shining when he was a practicing alcoholic. I'm functional, but practicing. Writing Dr. Sleep gave him a chance to approach the same material as a new sober man, and this film adaptation allowed him to reconcile some things with Kubrick's Shining, which he notoriously disliked, calling it chilly. The biggest change that we made was to the third act, which in the novel takes place on the campground that used to be the site of the Overlook Hotel. And so the pitch was, let's keep the hotel uh, alive so that we can stage that final battle in the Overlook itself. And the trade-off is, you know, we're changing the ending of Doctor Sleep, but we're changing it to be the ending of The Shining that King never got to see made. Unlike his dad, Dan rejects the free ghost dream, so he's sober when Abra sees Rose coming around the mountain. Rose gets to the Overlook and steps inside, where she gets a good look at their world-famous blood elevators! Give them a hand, folks! That's a lot of blood! Rose 
likes it. The blood elevator was one effect Flanagan couldn't accomplish practically. It was just too expensive to do the same way Kubrick did, so they recreated this sequence digitally. Rose finds Dan and Abra standing on the staircase in the Colorado Lounge, and as she threatens them from Jack's super productive writing spot, they launch into their plan with two pairs of white eyeballs. Together, they transport Rose into the Overlook Hedge Maze, which, wow, looks like they've really expanded it over the years. Glad to see the hotel taking pride in its hedges. Rose follows Abra's footprints to the center of the maze, where she finds the young girl waiting, waiting to do a Mortal Kombat teleport attack! Oh, with a friggin' shank! After a few of those, Rose puts an end to that, and is just about to monologue her way inside a lockbox when she realizes that this isn't Abra's mind at all. Fuck this noise, Rosie out! Sorry, Dan. Nice try, though. How the hell did we miss you? Probably the booze. She approaches him and offers a long life of eating well and staying young. His answer is to swipe at her with an axe, but he's no match for Rose the Hat. She stabs him in the leg and tosses him down the stairs in an impressive fall performed by McGregor's stunt double, Stephen Atkinson. Loves seeing behind the scenes footage like this. It lets us see the hard work put in by the stunt team led by Chuck Borden. She pounces on him and thumbs out some delicious Danny steam, seasoned by a long life of trauma. You taste that whiskey. She gets a tad too high off his painful memories, and when she goes snooping towards his boxes, Dan's happy to open them for her. They're starving! The horde of hungry Overlook ghouls attack Rose the Hat, shunting at her face to get that sweet, sweet steam. Together, they kill her, which happens a bit too quickly for my liking. She's one of my favorite villains ever. But in the end, she cycles away, leaving nothing but a cloud of steam and a free hat for the taking. The ghosts then turn their attention back to their favorite boy. Hello, Danny. And similarly swarm him, too. This is when I think the movie goes a bit too far with the Shining references. I'm fine with the possessed Dan chasing Abra with an axe, because that actually comes from the Shining novel, only it was Jack chasing Danny. But I don't think we needed to hear Horace Derwent again. Great party, isn't it? Especially after Dan already referenced that line earlier. Great party, isn't it? Abra goes into room 237, home of the mossy Nakey lady, who was played by Sally Hooks wearing five hours worth of makeup. Hilariously, she often forgot what she looked like with the nude prosthetics, and would sometimes sit around set with her robe undone, looking indecent even though she actually wasn't. <laughs> I forgot. Dan finds Abra, but breaks free of his possession and tells her to run away so he can blow this pop stand up, blow it up. She runs outside, and although the hotel tries to use Dan to turn the boiler off, he resists and takes a seat to watch it break down instead. Flames spread out and block his exit, committing him to this sacrifice. But at least he's not alone here. His ghost mom Wendy shows up to spend his final moments with him. They're together again, content, as the Overlook burns down around them. Sometime later, Abra chats with the ghost of Dan, who's visiting her just like Dick used to visit him. He apologizes for what he told her when they first met, that she should keep her head down and her shining to herself. Shine on, Abra Stone. You shine on. And I think that crazy diamond will, since she confesses to her mom that she talks to ghosts now, but frames it in a comforting way, just like Dr. Sleep himself. We go on. In a lesser movie, I might find this ending kind of cheesy, but here it feels in line with Flanagan's trademark tone, a kind of melancholic optimism. There can be no horror if there isn't caring and love. Mm -hmm. That's very important, and I think a lot of filmmakers miss that, and uh, Mike doesn't. Mike. Mike understands. The movie ends with Abra heading to the bathroom like young Danny Torrance did. She's ready to box up Mrs. Massey as Midnight with the Stars and You plays us out. Whew, that was a big one. I think we earned ourselves some numbers. After all, that was a great kill count, wasn't it? Mmm. 18 people died in Doctor Sleep, quite a bit more than the two kills in The Shining. There were 6 female victims and 12 male victims, with ages ranging from toddlers to millennium old vampires. With a theatrical version runtime of 152 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 8.44 minutes. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to Grandpa Flick, which also serves as an award for the cycling in general. I just think it looks incredible. Sorry, baseball boy! Dom Machete for lamest kill will go to that Charlie dude in the hospice, though it sort of feels like cheating giving it to him. 
Oh well. And that's it. Doctor Sleep came out in 2019 and is one of my three favorite horror films of that year, along with Ready or Not and The Lighthouse. They all press very different buttons for me. Once again, you'll get this week's kill count a day early, because on New Year's Eve, I'm looking at the weird British film Bloody New Year. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. It's been the Kill Cap. Thanks a lot for watching this very long Kill Cap. I want to thank some patrons like Shannon McDowell, Matthew Imes, Ariana Padilla, and Alex C. One Kill Count left for 2020, and it's one of those unknown weird movies that I always have a blast covering. I promise to do a cut comparison for Dr. Sleep and Jennifer's Body, probably in the first few months of 2021. Thanks, everyone. Be good people.